And it's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Kava Baharvan. He is DMD, MSLL, graduated in 2011 as the valedictorian from Debrecen University School of Dental Medicine in Hungary when he was only 22 years old. There, he then applied for the international program in the United States and started his advanced standing program in Boston University, Henry M. Goldman School of Dentistry and Medicine. In 2012, he practiced as a general dentist in Fall River and Dorchester, Massachusetts, before attending the orthodontic program at Jacksonville University. Concurrent with his orthodontic training, he was enrolled in a master's degree program in organizational leadership at the Davis College of Business. He is a member of various honor societies in the United States, such as Omicron Kappa Upsilon, Phi Kappa Phi, Omicron Kappa Delta Kappa, and Beta Sigma Gamma. And upon graduation, he hopes to pursue opportunities in both academia and the private practice of orthodontics with his wife, Dr. Julia King, who's in the same orthodontic residency that he went to, and they just celebrated the birth of their first child. Congratulations on the birth of your first son. Thank you very much, Howard. It is my it is my pleasure being here. I've been listening to Dennis Ron Censored for the past, I think, one year or two years, you know, every almost every day driving to work, coming back home. Uh, my wife and I enjoy listening to you. Thank you, thank you for inviting me. And it's so neat. Um, I, I um, when you look at marriage divorce study data, it's so interesting. The countries that have arranged marriages, like mm-hmm. India, they have a 10% failure rate divorce. In the countries like America, it's a love marriage, it's almost 50-50. But when you mine down the data in the United States, if the man and woman both have a master's degree or above in the same thing, they have only a 10% divorce rate. So since you and your wife have so much in common intellectually, um, that, that it's a, probably a 90% chance you guys will write out to the end. So congratulations. <laughs> I tell every time I lecture in dental school, I always tell them, before you leave dental school, find your spouse. Um, you know, I mean, it, it's it's the best advice ever. That's what I did. We're, in fact, classmates back in Boston, too. Uh, so, so we've been sharing classes for now over five years, yeah. Wow. So, yeah. Um, what, so how long have you been an orthodontist now? Uh, so I'm still in my orthodontic residency. I'm graduating this year. And uh, I started my residency two years ago. It's a two-year program in Jacksonville. And um, it, the clock is ticking now for my graduation. In fact, it's next month, July 7th, uh, getting ready for the next stage. So now, and so you're in the second year of the ortho residency. That's correct, yes. The second, uh, the second and final year. Yes. And your wife's in the first year of the residency? Yes. So, so what are you thinking? Um, do you think you and your wife will, work to, will start a de novo orthodontic practice and work together? Uh, do you think um, you'll each start your own? What, 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 is, what does it look like um, for you guys? What, what are your pros and cons of your future business model? Yes. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting question. We've been, we've been entertaining different ideas, my wife and I, uh, you know, ever since we started orthodontics and maybe even before that. Uh, when she was a gentle dentist. Um, you know, there's cons and pros to everything. You know, maybe before the birth of my son, uh, I was very much leaned toward uh, either purchasing an existing practice or, as you mentioned, you know, starting up. Uh, but with the baby now, uh, you know, I love my family. I spend a lot of time playing with him. It's, it's just the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. Uh, I don't believe time-wise would be a right time for me to... Uh, add the stress of running something. You know, I'm, I'm a big believer in owning a business, but I think at this very moment is not probably the best time for me. Uh, but it is on the list, and I think uh, eventually uh, Julie and I would be sharing practices, you know, but I don't see it in, in um, maybe not in the next two, three years. Uh, well, you know, you make a, a great point. When you buy an existing practice, there's so much less risk. I mean, it costs more to buy than to build a star, but when you build a DeNovo from scratch, you have to wear all the hats. You're a young family, a young father. You gotta wear all these hats that they didn't train you in any of your education. When you buy an existing practice, there's no risk because you've already got a management team. I mean, obviously if there were two orthodontic practices for sale and one, the average employee had been there 10 to 12 years well hell they could run they could replace you with a droid they could they could buy r2d2 or c3po if it did ortho you know what i mean um but when you um 
but if there's two products for sale, one had the average staff in there 12 years, and the other one, the average staff be there two years. Obviously, the one with the average staff in there 12 years is running on autopilot, and in my opinion, would be twice as valuable as the one. But uh, but yeah, if you did um, go buy an existing, where you know, like 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 in my dental office, I mean, we we got staff that's been there 10, 20, 30 years. We still have our first dental assistant. Um, no, not, not one person on my team would ever need to talk to me again. <laughs> and if somebody bought that, they wouldn't need to talk to that person either. So, uh, so you have nothing but options. You know, um, you very interesting point uh, regarding the risk and benefits and, you know, being knowledge and being literate about uh, the business of dentistry. Well, let me tell you this. In 2011, when I came to the United States, I landed in Los Angeles. Uh, I was so uninformed. I was so illiterate about how the financial system runs in the States uh, that uh, this friend of mine, Dr. Kassiri, now she practices in Colorado, took me to the Chase Bank, you know, it was in Koreatown, Los Angeles. She took, she took me to the Chase Bank to open a bank account with my money in there, you know, I couldn't keep it in my bag. Uh, so they were explaining to me, and they spent maybe half an hour explaining the difference between a checking account and a saving account. And a lot of people living in the States take this as granted that, oh, God, you know, everyone knows. A five-year-old knows the difference between a checking account and a saving account. But in a lot of countries, including Iran or, you know, maybe in Hungary, there aren't really checking it. There's, there's only an account and there's a bank account. And not only that, in a lot of countries, there, there are no credit cards. You know, there is no credit line. And they call their debit card credit card. So entering into the United States with such sophisticated, you know, financial system, economical system, I knew I'm way behind. I learned a lot. And that's why, you know, I pursued the, the degree in Davis College Business when I came here in Jacksonville. Uh, I, I needed to learn the basics, not only, you know, the, the higher level things, but the basics. And I'm, I'm very glad I pursued it. I think uh, I feel more confident now doing something independently on my own. Uh, I think it's, it was very important. Yeah, I see so many dental schools where you have the option that not only can you get a dental degree, but at the same time you can get a master's in public health. It's like, okay, well, why don't you just go get on the same time, get a PhD in biology, algebra, trig, and a million other things that you'll never use in your entire life unless you're a teacher or researcher. And I wish all the if, – if everybody that graduated from law school and medical school and dental school at the same time had an MBA – the Congress wouldn't be insane. The healthcare system wouldn't be. Um, in fact, remember, I remember um, this before your time, but we, we had a president a while back. Uh, it was um, um, it was uh, Bill Clinton. And one of his campaign deals was he was going to put 100,000 more police officers on the street. And I wrote him letter after letter saying, why don't you put 100,000 MBAs in government? Why don't you commit to taking 100,000 people out of their jobs across every agency in America and make them spend a two-year sabbatical getting MDA and then send them back to the Department of Motor Vehicles and it wouldn't take you 30 hours to get a driver's license. <laughs> so, so, so you were born in Iran. How old were you in Iran before you moved to Hungary? I was 16 years old. Oh, so you're all mm -hmm. fluent in Farsi and, and yeah. everything going in Tehran. So then you lived in Hungary from age 16 to 22? That's correct, yes. And then you've been here from 22 to 28? That's right. <laughs> I mean, you are like, I mean, think about that. I mean, think about how many, I mean, you're like, you, you know, if you'd have been born 500 years ago, you, your name would be Marco Polo. <laughs> I mean, not many people, I, I, I think you become so intelligent when you live in three different tribes because so many people, like, like Americans, when you meet an American and they have a bad attitude toward like, uh, say, socialized medicine. They're like, well, that's socialized medicine, like, like Scandinavia. It's like, dude, have you ever been to Scandinavia? You live in Oklahoma, okay? Oklahoma would be the armpit of Denmark, Norway, Sweden. Not one person in Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Finland would move to Oklahoma, okay? So why is it a bad thing that it's socialized medicine, like from Scandinavia? And, uh, you know, so it's funny. So I think you... Um, you are beyond smarter than you realize because when you grow up in one tribe and drink the purple Kool-Aid, you don't know what's what's real and what's not. But when you've already lived in three different continents and three different uh, civilizations, you uh, 
you, you're you're wise beyond your ears. It reminds me of my favorite endodontist, Bambi Durogan Tebby. He was from uh, went to dental school in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And when I, um, when he was my instructor at UMKC, I used to always say, why are, why are you just so smart? And is it because you're cynical? Is because, what is it about you? And he goes, well, he goes, there's three camps. There's Germany, they affect all of Europe, Japan, and we're talking about dentistry, Japan, all of Asia, and the United States, all of North America. And if you're born in one of those three camps, you believe whatever they tell you. Mm -hmm. But when you're growing up in Nigeria, and Nigeria isn't one of the camps, they always taught us, well, the Japanese think this, the Germans think this, the Americans think that, and then they would triangle and figure the truth was somewhere in the middle. Yeah. And uh, so you've already had a triangle between uh, Iran, Hungary, and the United States. So that, that is so darn cool. What would you say to a kid? Podcasters are very young. Yeah. A lot, About 20% of them are still in dental school. What would you say to a kid in dental school who was thinking about going to um, orthodontic uh, school? Um, how hard is it to do the orthodontic residency application? I mean, how, what would you say to a junior who's thinking, I kind of want to be an orthodontist? What would you say to that person? That's a very good question. Honestly, I think a lot of uh, dental students, you know, not only in the United States, but also abroad, you know, internationally speaking, are having the same question. That what does it take for me to be an orthodontist in the United States? Or what does it take to, you know, what, uh, what does it take to get into an ortho residency, you know? Um, and I had the same exact question. And the difference was I really had nobody to tell me because I just landed in the States. You know, I started my band studying at Boston University. Uh, it was just about the time I started making friends, no family, no connections, nothing. I had to establish everything from zero and start and, and also answering this question at the same time. Um, so let me um, take you back a little. Uh, Going back to the previous topic you mentioned about, you know, the, the importance of being multicultural and meeting different people from around the world, uh, it all started with my father's vision that when I was younger, I was uh, 14, 15, he said, hey, Kava, you know, I'm thinking of sending you to London for, for, for your summer. I'm like, London? That, that sounds good, but it's, it's out of blues. He's like, yeah, but I want you to meet people from, from different countries, from different cultures, uh, so that you know how things are outside of Iran. And then you'll make your decision whether you like to stay here or, you know, you like to pursue your education elsewhere. So he sent me to London. You know, I lived in London for three months. It was awesome. It was very good. It was beautiful. A very good experience. I came back and I told my dad, dad, sign me up for, uh, for my next level somewhere, somewhere abroad. UK didn't work, work out. And, uh, you know, long story, a lot of things happened. I, I landed in Hungary. And uh, it was where I met a lot of people, different cult culture, from people from Israel, from U.S., in fact, from Canada, uh, from Iran, from Middle East, from Africa, all coming together under the roofs of an educational institution, which was Debrecen University, which I think is the, is the most beautiful thing ever. Everyone's together for a good reason, for learning, for becoming a better person. Um, I moved to the States because, you know, I believed in uh, the so-called American dream, uh, I was listening to your podcast. Uh, you uh, were talking to the founder of Bisco. Um, I believe he was a Korean uh, chemist, if I'm not wrong. And he mentioned, I think, one of the best examples of an American dream. A person with uh, zero, maybe, I don't know if he said, I think $50 in his pocket. He moved to the States of San Francisco. And he built a, a company of such great success. You know, and, and that, that's, you know, the stories of that, you know, was what motivated me to move to the States. I thought, you know, if I move to the United States, if I contribute to the society I live in, if I work hard, uh, you know, the American dream would let me uh, become a successful person, to be somebody important. And so I came, I went to Los Angeles first. I lived there for eight months uh, before I moved to Boston University. I served in Boston, and then I faced the question that, okay, now I always wanted to be an orthodontist, but what does it practically take to become one? And, um, you know, it takes a lot because uh, um, ortho residency is very competitive. And uh, I think the orthodontists are the highest, by number, are the, uh, the most uh, common specialists in, in the country. I think um, last time I checked, there are close to 196,000 dentists in the United States and 10,000 are orthodontists. Uh, so it's a big number, but although it's a big number, it's also very competitive to get in. So 
what is your formula? What's that secret in ingredient to become an orthodontist? Um, and it's a different, you know, it's, it's different for every school. It's different for every school. It is definitely doable, but it takes a lot of hard work. Uh, it's very important where in your class I think you stand, because uh, based on uh, what I see in different schools, they a lot of schools have a filter that if your GPA falls below a certain level, uh, you don't even qualify to for the next stage for the review of everything else. Uh, so I think the, the grades are very important. Uh, I had a difficult time back in Boston because um, the schedule was very, very compact. It was very difficult. You know, Time-wise, I literally had no personal time whatsoever, and um, I still had to manage getting you know straight A's and um, and other stuff. Next thing is research. You know, they'll, they'll like people with research backgrounds. There's a lot of uh, ortho programs. You know, they come with an MSD. Uh, they want you to have some experience before you start. And uh, I had zero experience, none. You know, back in Hungary, nobody told me, and I never thought research would be important. You know, but things are different in the states. You know, uh, people value research a lot more. You know, academically, it's pursued a lot better. Uh, so I had to find a research project where I could be involved in. And I was getting rejections after rejections. Um, and all for the same common reason that you're an advanced standing student and you have you cannot commit time. And the minimum was 10 hours a week. And I, I didn't have 10 hours a week of personal life, so be it, you know, a research time. But luckily, I managed to uh, start a research project with Dr. Judith Jones at BU. Uh, it was about the quality of life in orthodontics. It was very successful, very well, and, um, you know, the next thing comes, if you're doing a research project, you want to make sure, uh, if you can, get it published or present your data different places, you know. If you keep on doing research and not really publish your data as if it never happened, you know, the knowledge would not be shared. You have to share your knowledge with the rest of the people. So I shared the knowledge I had, the results of my project uh, in North Carolina, in Charlotte, North Carolina. It was an interesting study. You might actually like it. Uh, so what I did, I was also at the same time being an or I was working as an ortho orthodontic assistant on Saturdays. Uh, there was one thing we realized with uh, my mentor, Dr. Sagafi, and, and working in her office that uh, a lot of people that you know were uh, sending for approval for for MassHealth, which is the Massachusetts Medicaid, were getting rejections. So we're wondering, like, what, what's going on? So why is it so difficult? You know, kids, we're seeing them, they're, you know, they have malocclusion. It's severe. We think they definitely need orthodontics, but they were, we're getting the letters back with your rejections. So I use the data from BU, Boston University, to see uh, if there's a correlation between the index Massachusetts, you know, MassHealth uses and the most contemporary in indexes, let's say, for example, ones used by NHS in, London, in England or uh, by another index that was developed at BU. And it was interesting to notice that one out of four, meaning one out of four Medicaid patients that walked into your office would be rejected, although they had severe malocclusion. And for one reason, the index that was used by MASO and the, the scoring that it had, it didn't match with the other indexes. Um, and so I found it very interesting because I, you know, I, I felt bad for the teams. You know, they uh, subjectively and objectively uh, needed orthodontic treatment, yet they were rejected. Um, so that was, that's another thing. Research something is important to apply for ortho. Uh, good grades, rank is very important because you know, some of the schools are easier, some of the schools are more difficult, uh, but rank always tells you where you've been in your class. Uh, and, you know, consistency, I think. That's key to, to be seen in an application. You want to show that you've been persistent and you were consistent in your pursuit of orthodontics. Uh, you know, we sometimes look and it, it's very interesting. I'm, I'm getting a lot of emails uh, with personal statements, you know, uh, uh, CVs, they want me to ask them, you know, to read them, proofread them. Uh, there was this one occasion where I looked at the personal statement, not even a single time the word ortho or orthodontist or orthodontics was mentioned in the personal statement. So I sent her an email back, I'm like, is this for ortho or something else? Uh, so it, it's very important to be very consistent, you know, with uh, your purpose. Um, you know, there is um, other stuff that kicks in. Uh, there is, I don't know if you're aware of the pass application, um, and there's a match application. Uh, with the pass, there's a lot of little things that people miss. 
uh, that uh, will impact, impact him negatively. Uh, and with a past application, for example, you know, the simplest thing I can say is the photo you attach to your pass. And it's, it's, it's just very interesting for me because, you know, last year I did uh, interviews for the, the, this year's applicants. And I also, uh, I also interviewed the fellows uh, for the Jackson University. And so two rounds of interviews, I noticed a lot of times people put, crop their photos, like the ones from Facebook, just because, especially girls, because they look cute in that photo. They crop it from their Facebook or whatever else, could be Instagram, whatever, and put it in their past application. And, and that questions me. I'm like, orthodontics is all about details of the smile, paying attention to details, knowing, you know, the little things. And when you don't pay attention to details like this, when at this very professional level you use your social media photo, then that takes me off. You know, or other people who are reading your application. So you might have worked real hard, but not paying attention to these details in, in the very competitive application cycle that you're entering might put you behind. Uh, personal statement is very important, uh, depending on who reads it. Uh, an issue with personal statement is that, uh, I mean, contrary to the fact that it's personal and it needs to be kind of what you like to write, but a lot of times it needs to be also tailored to your audience, to the person who's reading it. And it's very different in different programs because, um, you know, it, it could be a young person like me reading it. It could be a more experienced orthodontist. It could be someone who doesn't even read all personal statements. But one more, one, if I have to say one thing about a personal statement which needs to be uh, uh, followed is the first paragraph. Um, a lot of times the interviewers are reading, I don't know, 100 applications. They're not going to read all the personal statements to the dots. So your first paragraph needs to be very, so strong that interest them to, to read the rest and interest them to you know, get into your application and know more about you. Your CV is extremely important and it needs to be very organized, you know, be very um, uh, easy to read to. I've seen very wordy CVs which are not good and uh, that could be a problem too. Uh, one interesting thing that uh, is interesting to know, Howard, it's, it's a new thing. It's called a DAT exam. Have you heard of it, ADAT, the Advanced Dental Admission Test? Uh, so it's a new thing. It's, it's basically, so remember, the, the, we have the National Board Exam, MBD Part 1 and Part 2. Um, they, years ago, they got rid of the grading. So it's only a pass and fail now. So they got rid of the grading because of, you know, reasons they had. And uh, so they start adding other exams that they are graded because, you know, you have to have a measure of knowing how people do uh, you, you know, it's hard to know, you know, their academic performance when there's no grades whatsoever. Uh, so the, I guess, my guess is that's the reason they added the ADAT. It's an exam you take when you're in third year or fourth year of dental school, or you can take it after, of s topics such as research or, uh, I don't know, um, clinical, some clinical questions, but it's a new exam and it's graded. Um, luckily, there aren't many programs that mandate ADAT in orthodontics. It could be different for other specialties. I think, uh, to the best of my knowledge, are there nine programs? Actually, there are six programs. I'm checking it right now. There are six programs that they require ADAT. So that's a new thing. So if you're applying to those six programs, you must have ADAT. And there are eight pro uh, or nine programs that uh, they accept ADAT. So meaning uh, you, you're not required to do that, but it will probably help you to take the exam and uh, basically uh, apply for the schools. You know, I mean, it's a new thing that I, you know, I don't really understand the, uh, the reason behind it and a lot of other things, but um, I find it difficult for someone who's been already a general dentist out there uh, for a couple of years uh, to go back and now take an exam, which is probably based on the stuff you learn in dental school. Uh, so, I, you know, and I personally believe a person who's been already a general dentist can be a better dentist uh, just because of all the knowledge they gain uh, <laughs> by being a general dentist. Yeah, I mean, that was a good question. You know, I think I uh, gave a long answer to your question, but it takes a lot and uh, persistence is very important. They, they need to show when people are reading their application, they must feel that this person has been working hard for this. Uh, you know, there's a saying that give the job to the person who wants it the most not to the person who's best at it. 
Uh, do, you, do you think it helped you getting into orthodontic school, being very competitive, that you had a master's degree in organizational leadership from the Davis College of Business? So I did my master's after I got into ortho. Uh, so the master degree, the, mas the business program uh, is right, it's a couple of steps from my ortho program. Uh, so when I got into JU, that was a time I'm, I found it a great opportunity for me to learn something uh, more than just dentistry, more than just orthodontics. Uh, so it just, you know, the, for the fact that the schools were so close, um, I thought I can attend night classes, um, and kind of that—that's what I did. Uh, I wish I had the masters before, and I think it helps. Uh, how much it helps, I don't know. I think it depends on who reads your application. Uh, but uh, this organizational leadership masters I did uh, purely was for me, because uh, as I said, uh, I didn't know anything about how finances work, economy works in the states. I learned a lot, but throughout years. But I was I was behind, you know. I needed to learn a lot about the law, about the economy, finances, about the strategies, and you know, a lot of other things that I'm very glad, you know, I learned at least the basics. Um, you know, a lot of people always think the sky is falling, and they always think times are so bad, and blah 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 blah. Then you, you know, they just haven't read a history book. I mean, I mean, look at the United States. Uh, you know, a hundred in 1962. A million people were killed in a civil war. A million when we only had 30 million people. And then we had World War One, World War II, depressions, all this stuff. So, it's, so in the last century, uh, so we're, we're 2017. Uh, we're 17 years into the century. The first 17 years of the last century, 5% of the planet dropped dead during the Spanish influenza. One in every 20 people died. And today we have all these vaccines, and then it's it's so crazy when you hear all these uh, movie stars talking about they they're not for vaccines. It's like, well, if you want to go back to the Spanish influenza and knock yourself out. But mm -hmm. I was wondering, uh, now that you and your wife are in ortho grad school, you know, do you think in um, twenty one seventeen, a hundred years from now, um, there will be massively less malocclusion? I mean, what caused the malocclusion? Because when you talk to the anthropologists. They say that this is a new deal when our diet changed, when we started eating with knives and forks and cutting up our food and eating refined grains that were discovered in the Fertile Crescent. Um, before that, there was no malocclusion because babies were chewing hard things. They were eating roots and beets, and the forces of mastication were off the charts. And now you have a, a baby son, and mm -hmm. nowadays babies, um, you know, switch to a little applesauce out of a jar yep. and if they have any difficulty nursing they switch to a sippy cup and a bottle and right now it seems like we're still in this uh you you said we that orthodontist was the most that's absolutely true if you cut the state of texas in half each half of texas would be larger than the second biggest state of texas and if you cut the number of orthodontists in half each half would be bigger than the second and third which is oral surgeons at 5,000 and periodontists, which is 4,000. And the reason there's so damn many orthodontists is because you feed, you take, you don't nurse your kid for a couple of years, you switch it to a bottle, a sippy cup, and feed it refined crap out of a jar, and he never gets any facial forces. But I was wondering this do you think, is your school, are they even starting to address that? Look, this is a completely new disease that just started when we changed our diet. Do you think in 2117, the trend will be trying to prevent your baby from needing orthodontists when it's 12? That let's prevent your baby so it doesn't need four bicuspids extracted? I mean, is, was there any talk about that in your program? Yeah, but that's a very great point you brought up. Uh, and you made it, you know, and you said it correctly. You know, a lot of people believe orthodontics is the, is the disease of modern society. Uh, in a sense that, uh, you know, so it goes historically going back, uh, there was an orthodontist, very one of the pioneer orthodontists, uh, Dr. Beck, who came here to the States. He was trained by uh, uh, bottle of orthodontics, you know, Angle, and he went back to Australia. And he went and looked at the aboriginals, you know, in, in Australia and New Zealand, and he noticed that, you know, they had perfect teeth. All teeth are aligned very nicely, 
and you know there's you know the malocclusion rate is very very low and um, and that was the conclusion that was made that you know today's age and uh, as you mentioned kids when they're very small and um, we change our their, you know first breastfeeding rate has been decreased uh, but mainly by a change of the society uh, so the kids have been breastfed less uh, there's a much higher rate of using pacifiers and um, the nature of the food has changed. It's very mushy. It's very soft. Uh, so there's really no strain. There's no uh, function over your musculoskeleton, you know, muscular muscles and, you know, uh, uh, skeleton, uh, which, you know, uh, again, uh, a lot of other people believe in the functional theory that uh, you grow muscle, you grow bone, your bone becomes harder based on the use. So if you don't use a muscle, it's just going to atrophy or you will never develop. So in a child who never really bites on anything hard, on a child that, you know, he, always, uh, he or she always, you know, eats cooked carrot and never an actual carrot that is uncooked, you know, uh, there's no chance for the body to become stronger. And it might lead to... That's one. The other thing is uh, also the respiratory system. That There's what? The, the breathing, basically. Your, uh, oh, breathing. Uh, that, you know, in, you know, we're not really letting our kids to be exposed to a lot of bacteria, to a lot of microbes. And um, so the rate of allergies and breathing problems are increased. Uh, so that itself will uh, cause... But the, but the, al- but the allergies, uh, they're now saying it's the same thing in modern society that... That in when you go to very poor countries and a one-year-old is crawling around on the ground and the floor and playing in the dirt, they mm-hmm. get exposed to all the antigens when they're supposed to. Yes. But then in an advanced society and everything's clean and washed and the baby bottles are boiled and washed, and this kid never gets exposed to, like, say, ant dung or m- <laughs> mouse fly. And then all of a sudden it's 12 years old. And it smells ant dung for the first time and goes into anaphylactic shock and has all these allergies. Again, the allergies uh, and asthma is, invert, is, is perfectly negatively correlated to income. So you get yeah. into the richest, cleanest fanatic, wipe everything down with a towel, and there's all this asthma. And then when you get to people who are born crawling around on the dirt, they don't seem to have malocclusions and asthma and allergies. <laughs> and you're absolutely right that you know because as and I always tease my mother. I have uh, five sisters and a brother, and I always and when I read this, I sent it home and I sent it to all my sisters and said none of us ever had any asthmas, and we all could agree that mom never kept a clean house. So mom's <laughs> mom's dirty, filthy house made all of her kids never have any asthma. And everybody thought that was pretty funny. But, but yeah. yeah, but back to the chewing of the carrot. I mean, stress equals force over area. If you're going to boil the carrot and turn it to mush and puree and feed it to him on a spoon, where's the stress equal force over area spreading the palate, developing the mandible? I mean, this. Uh, but um, do, do, but 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 are they starting to address that? And and also, you've lived in three different countries. Is was malocclusion incidents different in Iran versus Hungary versus L.A. versus Boston? You know, it's a hard question. I don't believe I have the knowledge to answer that question. Um, that'd you know, be a neat study. That, that'd be a very neat study to compare the rate of, and I'm sure it's been done. Uh, I'm not aware of it. Uh, uh, to compare the rate of malocclusion, different malocclusions uh, in different places. You know, there, there's been studies, for example, they know uh, class three malocclusions, you know, when your lower jaw is lower forward, is more common among Asians, you know. But that is probably something to do with the genes. Or, uh, you know, cerebral malocclusions are more common, but whether crowding, for example, uh, is present more in the Middle East or if it's present more in Eastern Europe, I'm not aware of that. Uh, you know, breathing is very important. The, uh, your uh, masticatory system is very important. And the more you help them, the more you train them, uh, the stronger they become. Uh, that's one reason. The other reason, I think, is also just apart from all the evolutionary uh, processes is also the change of our society and the fact that we're becoming more, you know, educated about beauty. Uh, The norms of beauty are changing. Uh, Maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago, you know, a little bit of crowd, lower crowding wouldn't be a big issue, but now it it has become more. So that's why we're seeing more treatments as well. 
Not only the malocclusion rate is increased, but also the treatment rate is increased. I'm going to write my own paper and publish it in my own magazine that uh, beauty is changing and it's shifting towards uh, fatter, balder, older men. <laughs> yes, that's right. I think that's I think that's where the trend's going. Um, I want to yeah. ask I want to ask you another thing. You know, um, pretty much from the airplane, you know, from Wright Brothers, you know, pretty much in my lifetime, an airplane. Oh, they get bigger, they get wider, they get longer. But you, every flight I've ever flown on from age 16 to 54, it still goes 550 miles an hour. And mm -hmm. that's kind of the way ortho was. You know, it was always 24 months. But finally, you see ortho now. We're saying it doesn't always have to be 24 months. There's accelerated ortho. And now there's a lot of orthodontists saying that they're now finishing a lot of their cases in only one year. What, what, do, you, what do you think about this accelerated ortho. Is it hype? Is it real? Is it fantasy? Is it fiction? Is it marketing? Or is it still just the old airplane going 550 miles an hour? Yeah, that's a very good question. Honestly, I think it's a very controversial topic, even in orthodontics. And it depends on who you're asking this question from. So if you ask this question from an academician, a person who does research, and they've you know, gathered the research results, it will probably tell you that, uh, yes, accelerated orthodontics works real good for the first three months only. Uh, you know, so the research data that is in front of, at least me at this point, tells you that, uh, yes, there's going to be an accelerated tooth movement caused by inflammatory processes uh, for the first, second, and third months. After that, basically starting from the fourth month, is the same. So you have to repeat what you did. Uh, and I'm talking mainly about, uh, you know, Propel and... Uh, basically periodontally accelerated orthodontics. Uh, if you ask the same question from a clinician who's been practicing it, they might answer you differently. Uh, and um, some of the people that I'm trusting as orthodontists, uh, they're my mentors, uh, they highly believe in some of the companies, uh, some of the systems out there. And yet uh, some of the other systems that have been advertised, I can't be very specific, but... Uh, they're not as they promised. Uh, they're not delivering as they promised. Um, I believe accelerated orthodontics is true. I believe... Um, so, slow, slow down a little bit. You, you keep saying accelerated orthodontics. So accelerated orthodontics is basically... Oh, used... you're, you're saying accelerated orthodontics. Yes, accelerated. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I call it accelerated. What do you call it? Accelerated. <laughs> oh, okay, so... It's... Just, uh, you're, you're saying it with a Boston it, accent, but you were saying yeah. accelerated. And, and you also said Propel. Um, a lot of kids out there might not uh, know what Propel is. Explain what Propel is and how that's accelerated orthodontics. Yes. Uh, again, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert when it comes to Propel or other accelerated techniques. But uh, so Propel is basically using little microscopes, little devices, to create perforations in the areas where you think uh, you would like to change the density of the bone. You would, you would like to introduce some inflammatory changes. Uh, so inflammation is involved in tooth movement. So if you create more cells, more factors which are causing inflammation, most, and you would change the density of the bone in the area, there's a higher chance that you can move teeth faster into that area. So strategically, placing little holes in the areas where you think teeth can, you know, you want your teeth to move, uh, can uh, help teeth move faster. Uh, again, uh, you know, you have to be uh, knowledge about uh, the evidence out there, uh, the latest evidence I've read, and there might be evidence coming after this, so I can't be 100% certain, is the fact that, you know, that accelerated orthodontics in the form of Propel is effective, certainly, for the first three months. And uh, thereafter, it, it might not be as effective. So it needs re repeating. Uh, but I should tell you one thing, and, and it's true with every research that we read. Uh, that research results, so be it about Propel, so be it about anything else, are based on means, are based on averages. So maybe in one patient, uh, Propel would be effective for three months, but for somebody else might be effective for 10 months because you know uh, it, it's the average. The results they have is the average. What they say is on average, three months. But uh, there are people, 50% of the people are above the average, the other 50 are below the average. So it, it's something you have to learn, but with a grain of salt. 
uh, that is not always three months. It, everyone's different. Everybody's physiology is different. Um, but um, but I believe in accelerated orthodontics, especially at the periodontally accelerated orthodontics. I think it's true fact. What do you think of the other uh, uh, thing they're always hearing about, um, Acceladent? I have never used Orth it. Ortho Excel Technologies, developer of Acceladent. Yes, I'm, I'm fully uh, familiar with Acceladent. I've seen their uh, ads and I know Orthodon is using it. I've never used it and um, I'm not a good person to comment on their efficiency. Uh, I just don't know. One, one last brand name I want to ask you about is uh, Invisalign. In my lifetime, you know, when I got out of school 30 years ago, the big brands of Colgate and Crest and Listerine, they, they were all established. But I would say, without a doubt, the largest brand name on the entire planet in dentistry has been um, Invisalign. I mean, they talk about that in Africa, Asia, Brazil. I mean, everybody, any any waitress that you've ever served you has heard of Invisalign. What, what are your thoughts on Invisalign? Uh, you know, in our lifetime, there are some companies that were, we consider them as uh, role model companies. They do very good in their marketing. They're really they're very successful in every aspect. Netflix is one, and Amazon is one. And in my opinion, a line company, um, and so you know, the Invisalign is is a very successful company. Uh, they do a very good job marketing, and they've developed and they've progressed being a much better appliance on moving teeth. Uh, you know, um, with Invisalign. Uh, the plastic of the Invisalign has changed. The attachments are changed. Uh, the experience of the orthodontist has changed with Invisalign. And I personally am a big fan of Invisalign. And, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, seminars you can attend about the practice management and Invisalign, how we can incorporate into your practice. Um, I think it's great. I still believe the lab fees are high. I'm not happy about that, but um, I think it's a great tool. Uh, with that being said, uh, if you're knowledge, because a lot of times we use Invisalign and we're not quite familiar with the ins and outs and we get certain results like posterior open bite or, you know, um, early contacts in the front or, you know, many other things. And uh, we're, with that kind of deters from using Invisalign and we're like, oh, you know, it's not as, as what it promised. Uh, it's important to learn to use it as a tool, like a hammer. You know, you have to know how to use a hammer, uh, not to you know, and make mistakes. And same thing with Invisalign, it's a tool, and I think it's a great tool, but you still have to be able to diagnose and treatment plan. Um, I love Invisalign. I can promise you I'll, I'll be using it a lot. I want to ask you a couple of uh, controversial questions. I want to ask you the biggest controversial question. Um, oh. <laughs> there's a, uh, well, this is dentistry and sensor. We don't like to talk about anything anyone agrees on, and I love the fact that you and your wife are still in school because it's so interesting to find out what you're being taught, you know, the, these days. But, um, you know, there's always extremists in every group. I mean, uh, um, you know, they're fanatics. And there are a bunch of general dentists who believe that you should never extract a bicuspid. Anybody that extracts a bicuspid is ditching the face and ruining the profile and making them look ugly. And, of course, I, I am extremely um, against all extremists. <laughs> and I don't think... Uh, I, I mean, so, so, but I think, see the pendulum swing. When I was little, it's no doubt that um, when I was little um, and I grew up in Kansas, all Catholic schools, all big families, only the most messed up girl got braces, you know, really? and, and they, they all invested only in the messed up girl because they wanted her to get married someday and make grandkids, right? Yeah. And now those families that were all five, six, seven kids. Now with birth control, that family's only two. So now everybody in the family gets braces. But back 30 years ago, I swear, almost everybody that I knew back in high school got braces, got their four by cuspids pulled, their four wisdom to pulled at the same time, and then they put into ortho. So that was way, way too much three decades ago. But some people think that pendulum should swing all the way to zero. What percent do you think due to their malocclusion, still need to have four bicuspids pulled. And what would you say to a dentist listening that says, I would never refer to an orthodontist that would pull four bicuspids. That's, that's old time. He's messing up the face. I don't care about the occlusion. I want him to look pretty because I'm telling you, there's a lot of dentists who, who think that way. You're right, yeah. 
Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, you know, as you said, the the dilemma between extraction and non-extraction has been an ever uh, everlasting story. It's you know uh, <laughs> that, that probably won't go away for another twenty years. No, it won't. And there are orthodontists out there that you know, uh, and in fact. You know, it goes all the way back to the father of orthodontics, modern orthodontics, in the angle, who said he was a non-extractionist. There were very diff there, there were different theories behind it. One person said, you know, he treated his wife with extraction, he didn't like the profile. Somebody else said, you know, he was a very religious person and he believed in God's giving you everything and you don't have to, you know, change, modify it, you know, that way. So there were a lot of theories behind why Angle did not want it to do extractions. Um, some people believe he, he just didn't have the good tool to move to. That's why he decided not to do attractions. You know, we have different appliances now. I, I can't tell you exactly what person of the people need attractions, but I'm absolutely certain that there are many cases, many cases that require attraction. And um, so one aspect of orthodontic treatment planning is, you know, looking at the person's beauty, face, or the face their soft tissue. And the other aspect, which you got to be very respectful is their periodontia and their occlusion. I mean, you can make teeth meet, so their bite are they're gonna bite and they can chew and they can survive. Do an extraction or not do an extraction. It's not gonna kill anybody. But you're not being too respectful in many cases to the period periodontia. So what about bone? What about blood supply? How about gum recession and you know, many other stuff? So it's true you probably will give them a full profile. That's something we like these days. But at the same time you might put, you know, put roots out of the bone. Uh, so, you know, I, I agree the pendulum today is toward non-extraction, and that's where I, I'm standing to. I like to exercise everything I, I know and I can do clinically before I pull teeth out, but um, there are many ways, many times that you cannot avoid extractions, and you know it from get-go. You know, you know that this is an extraction case. You know, it's just impossible. You have a fish tank, a small fish tank, and you're trying to put a, a whale in there. How's that even possible? Uh, so I, I believe, you know, it's not good to be in any extreme. Uh, and those dentists, so be it general dentists or orthodontists, uh, same way, who believe uh, that you can treat every single case non-attraction, uh, need education. Uh, so you need I, want to I want to ask you the same thing about headgear. When thirty, when I was little, not not thirty years ago, is when I got out of dental school. But I, I'd say forty years ago was, you know, I graduated from high school in eighty, so seventy six to eighty, so many of those people in braces were in headgear, and we used to wonder what's more important, dental health or mental health? How <coughs> mentally healthy could you be wearing headgear in high school? I mean, it's already tough to go to school when you got acne and pimples, or you know, you're trying to find your way. But then the orthodontist is making you wear some headgear. Um, what? Do has what is the instance of headgear today? Do you, does it still have a place? Does it still need to be done? Um, because you know, can you anchor it with uh, what do they call them? Tads? Those little um, what it was? Tad stand for? Uh, temporary anchors device. Yeah, a little, a little implant. So, so the same question with headgear. It's it's great too. It's it's funny that you asked that. I had a faculty member once. Uh, he's from Mexico. He said he had a friend in Washington years ago, years, years ago, maybe in the uh, 60s or 70s, uh, that he used to use fixed headgear, that he used to just place it there. He's like, I don't care. I know you're not going to wear it, so we're going to do a fix. He said, he used to tell the parents, trust me, it only takes a few months, but I'll give you results. And, you know, things were different back then. People used to trust the orthodontist. It's not like now. Uh, um, so he got results. But going back to I just a few minutes ago said I don't like to be in extremes when it comes to headgear or most of the actual appliances. Unfortunately, I see myself in an extreme that I would like to avoid any extra oral appliance for as much as I can. There are many, many instances where I sit down in a diagnostic seminar with a bunch of other residents or, or trained orthodontists and we start talking about a treatment. Okay, let's do this. Let's do headgear. I do six months of this, this and that. And in our treatment plan, we forget the first and the most important thing, that we're working on human beings with feelings. And for me, I know I'm not going to wear headgear. I know kids don't like to wear headgear. Nobody voluntarily wears headgear. And I don't believe they will wear it. 
So it would not only it's inefficient, but also it's a waste of time. And you're you're you start creating bad you know, and that's to start a lot of you know awkward conversation with the parents. Hey, salad didn't work. Head your um, you know, this is not going well. So you start having a lot of conversation you normally you wouldn't like to have. I personally believe uh, I can manage my me mechanics mo most of the time without using headgear or most of your control appliances. There are a lot of people, many people still use it, but I'm not one of them. Now I want to uh, completely just throw you under a bus, run over you, and put in reverse and back over you again. We, I want you to go on a dental town. Uh, we, have, we have 50 categories, and one of them's ortho. And yesterday, a 77 year old orthodontist named Teddy Rostein, DDS, PhD, he's got two doctorates. He's 77. He has created the most controversial thread we've ever had on Dental Town uh, okay. in ortho. He is putting six brackets on each side, the, the canines and two bicaps on each side. Mm -hmm. And he calls it orthodontic jaw wiring for weight control in the dental professional's office. And people come in and they, he, they pay him $2,800 and he wires their jaws shut so they cannot open their mouth and eat or chew. And his patients are losing about 20 pounds a month. And he's 77. I mean, he's an orthodontic. I mean, first of all, if he had me at age 23, he'd be my dad. I'm, I'm not going to disrespect someone who's old enough to be my dad. Number two, I've only got one doctor, and he has two. And mm -hmm. number three, I'm kind of torn on this issue because people, you, you said these people have feelings. I see patients go get gastric bypass surgery. I see people 10, 20 years ago taking FenFen and getting heart valve problems. Mm -hmm. and, and, I mean, I see people um, get tummy tucks and all this stuff like that. Um, I, I've seen people do extreme stuff, so I kind of think it's conservative. But, oh, my God, on Dental Town, there's people. The, the debates are all over the place. Some are saying, well, first of all, this isn't in your scope. You're an orthodontist. You're not a, a weight loss. You're not a yeah. psychologist. You, they, they should be going to a psychologist talking to someone. Oh, why do you compulsively? But I wish you'd go in there and um, read that thread or weigh in on it because, uh, I don't know, I, 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 I like the idea, I, well, I think of my own children. I got four boys and two grandkids. If they come to me and said, Grandpa, I'm either going to get a gastric bypass surgery or go to the orthodontist to wire my jaw shut, well, shit, I'd send the orthodontist 100 to 1. You can reverse that, yeah. but you can't reverse a gastric bypass surgery. What, what, what are your thoughts on that uh, orthodontic jaw wiring for weight loss? It's very interesting. Uh, you know, I haven't read that, so I, I'm very curious to sit down and read it tonight. Um, okay, I'm going to forward you the thread. It's on Dental Town. Uh, go to Orthodontics. Um, uh, Ryan, will you forward that to uh, that email? <laughs> I also wish you'd email that thread around your, uh, your ortho school because um, I guarantee you I can't find any source for this, but I'm pretty sure... Somebody was doing that before Teddy like 50 years ago. I'm pretty sure when I was like a freshman in dental school in like 1983, I kind of remember someone talking about some other guy doing this. So I don't think he invented this. He's been he's done the most. He's publishing it. He's talking about it. But again, humans are extremely complex. You said it first. These people, these teeth are actually attached to a human with a lot of feelings and I wonder, of the 30,000 suicides each year, how many of them might have even been related to that they, they were overweight and couldn't lose weight? And there, there was one on news the other day. Some boy um, committed suicide, and they linked it back. This girl kept um, calling him fat, fat ass, fatty, fatty. And, you know. So I, I don't know. I, I, but I, I think it deserves a lot of debate because obviously obesity is a rising epidemic. And I'm not talking about just in my chair i'm talking about in countries all over the world you know but uh so it'd be interesting um yeah it'd be, it'd be fun to see if you get any of your uh uh classmates to uh talk about that you know what i, I mean definitely read it watch it first read it and then share it with the rest of my classmates do it it's very interesting you mentioned that i have you know it's it, as you said it's as controversial as it can be uh if you ask me a question is it effective to lose weight it is effective because you know you're losing weight, and I'm sure people would not not being able to open their mouth, they're going to lose weight. 
But is it a way to lose weight? That's the question. Is it a correct way of losing weight? Then my answer is going to be negative. I mean, as you said, these people probably need a psychological help rather than uh, an orthodontist's help. Uh, but it, it's I need to read it. I mean, uh, it's, it's very interesting that now, you know, 2017, uh, uh, with all these, you know, all the social media and everything that's going around us, you know, uh, someone's, you know, brave enough to do this. Uh, interesting. Very interesting. And last, last thing, uh, you promised me an hour of your life and I've only got you for four more minutes and I'm so grateful. I just want to ask you one last controversy. I, I sure. want to keep asking you questions so no matter what you answer, you'll piss off half the people listening. Um, <laughs> Some people, uh, I mean, that's why I call it Dennis Rand Censored. You know, let's talk about what they don't agree on. Um, some people do not agree that there is a benefit to two-phase treatment. Some people think it's a scam. Uh, some people say there's nothing you can do at a six or seven-year-old that you couldn't do one time at 12 years old. You just want, you just want mom to give you 1500 now when she's little because you don't want to wait six years and have her come back and give you a 6000 So my succinct question is, there are a lot of dentists who think my pediatric dentist is doing that on all these kids, giving them a rapid palatal expander and all this stuff. And, and uh, he's saying he's fixing the skeletal now when he can. And then the orthodontist will fix the teeth. Um, but so, so bottom line, some people think it's uh, a scam. Some dentists think it's a scam. Some dentists think, no, you have to treat the skeletal between six and eight. And then you can treat the, the, the teeth from 12 to 14. So my mm -hmm. question to you is, is there a is there a reason why there's a, why there's a lot of two phase orthodontic treatment, or could you basically treat everything twelve to fourteen in one phase? Uh, you know, it's it's a great question. I think uh, there's absolutely there are some absolute indications for a two phase treatment, uh, and mainly because of growth. You know, the set amount of occlusions that my negatively impacted growth. Uh, so I do believe in two phase treatment. But I do believe in another fact, too, that if you ever decided to do phase one, you must have a very, very, very important, uh, basically, reason for it. it you know, it, it, my experience has showed me two-phase treatment is, is either being used too much or too little in different practices. So uh, those who actually really believe in two-phase, they use it a lot for maybe a lot of cases that they shouldn't be just using like a lot of times, a patient might come constricted um, transversely with no shifts, with no other issue. You know, to put an expander there, is it going to hurt? No, it's not going to hurt, but is it necessary? I don't believe so. Or a lot of people, you know, they put, you know, uh, functional appliances too early before even the growth of spurt. Is it going to hurt? Again, I don't think so. Is it going to be effective? The answer is negative too. So I think you must have a very good reason to get in early, but, uh, and also, to, you must know before you start when to get out. And we all hear around us, you know, there are, there's been kids in treatment for four years. You know, oh, my son's been in treatment since he was, you know, uh, in the fifth grade or whatever. You know, it's all because, you know, they started a phase one, but they didn't have a clear end, and it went into phase two, and a phase two to fall into. Uh, does phase one always lead to phase two to be easier or shorter in time? The answer is no, not always. Uh, but sometimes, mainly when it involves growth and uh, negative effects on the growth, uh, I think you need to do phase one. Uh, my indications are usually very narrow, like something like anterior cross pipe shifts and uh, some of the others, but mainly function or growth related. That's more, that's when I like to get in. Um, I see a lot of phase twos uh, that have been used for not a good reason, and that typically... Uh, is happens in the same office you know uh, some people use it a lot some people just don't use it as much well that was the fastest hour podcast i've ever done i can't believe we already did an hour um, I, I, I just want to tell you that uh you know it's a friday afternoon and you decided to come on my show and talk to my homies for an hour and it was so amazing to talk to someone who's in ortho grad school and i just want to tell you that thanks for writing that article in ortho town magazine Mm -hmm. um, that was amazing. Um, thank you for writing an, order, art, an article for Ortho Magazine. Thanks for coming on the show. Uh, good luck with that marriage. Good luck with that new baby. And I hope you have a rocking good weekend. Thank you very much, Howard, for inviting me. I, as you said, I can't believe one hour is over. I wish it was 10 hours.
But thanks very much. And, and do email that uh, orthodontic weight loss, Dale, because yeah. I'll tell you what, if you ask me, what's the bigger market in America? Whiter, brighter, sexier teeth or weight loss? I mean, you know it's got to be weight loss. Weight loss it is, yes. Don't you think? Yep. Oh, I, yeah. So I wonder, so I'm just curious if this will be a big trend, but email that thread around and, and see if you think this is going to be something that explodes in dentistry. Have a great day. Thanks very much.